All right. Hello, Mixed Asian Media Festival attendees. Thank you for sticking around after our special showing of the Sensei. My name is Lauren Lola. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Programming for Mixed Asian Media Fest. I come to you today from the Chochenyo Ohlone Territory in the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. I am a mixed race woman with shoulder length black hair, dark brown eyes, and medium tan skin. And behind me is a white wall with a poster of a window looking out into a tree. Before we get started, I want to thank our co-presenter, Saga Action Arts, for being, well, co-presenting today's program. And if you have any questions for our special guest, be sure to drop them in the chat. We will be getting to them in the last 10 or so minutes of today's session. So without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome our special guest. She is the writer, director, producer, and one of the lead actors of the film you just saw, The Sensei. If you follow Mixed Asian Media, you might recognize her from our March issue earlier this year when we did, as she has told me, the first interview conducted with her following her appearance as the magistrate on season two of The Mandalorian. Please welcome Diana Lee Inosanto. Hi, Diana. Hi, thank you for the, you know, the warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Diana Lee Inosanto, actor, filmmaker, martial artist. Um, I, my pronouns are she, her, they them. Um, I am joining you actually from outside of Los Angeles in Ventura, Ventura County. And this is actually an ancient land that once is pretty much uh, where we have our Chumash uh, Indian tribes here, which I'm very proud of. And we have an amazing museum. Um, I'm a mixed race woman. I am of Filipino, uh, it's like Chinese, Spanish and Irish French ancestry. And behind me is this uh, wooden dark walnut uh, cabinet doors and with some gold knobs to open and close them. And anyway, that's my background, but here you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to have you, Diana, and we're so glad we got to show your film, The Sensei, for our inaugural Mixed Asian Media Fest. And, you know, when we spoke earlier, obviously we talked about it a little bit, but, you know, for obvious reasons, I want to dive into deeper into it this time around. Um, but before we do, I wanted to ask, I know that when the film initially came out, it played a lot at a bunch of different film festivals. How is it for you to have your film featured in a festival again after all this time? Uh, really, it's it's amazing because it introduces um, the film to a whole new audience and also a, a whole new audience that, thank goodness, is receptive because when my movie first came out, that it, you know, when I started doing the film festival, um, this was hard because this still was a, a time when we didn't have a uh, marriage uh, equality for our LGBTQ, you know, uh, community. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I had a lot of resistance. I had a couple of death threats because people were very angry that I would dare write and direct a movie about a gay teenager learning martial arts. They had never been done before. So for me to have it in this festival, um, in light of these times, how people are much more open and receptive, um, I, I love it, and and it's so nice to be able to share this because this was um, a very important film for me as my first film to 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 you know uh, create, and um, I'm just glad to be here. So thank you for sharing it because it means a lot to me. Of course, we're so glad we're able to give you this platform. So I wanted to dive into it. How did you come up with the idea for the sensei, and why was it important for you to pursue it? Well, um, I will tell you that um, for many years, um, I had, you know, I had uh, tried to be an actress in Hollywood. And at that time, um, Hollywood did not have a call for diversity. In fact, I remember mm -hmm. as an actress, um, I would sometimes, I mean, you know, they would have these small, tiny little roles and they knew maybe they, you know, to make everybody happy, whoever they was, um, they would, you know, have us all people of color audition for one tiny little role. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So it was really hard um, to find work as an actress as much as I loved it and had been trained in it. And um, But because of my martial arts skills, um, I did find um, one back door into working in Hollywood, and that was as a stunt woman. And so I was able to be on many different sets both tv and and film and work with some of the best directors and producers in hollywood and i treated that as as my my film school but later on um when i wasn't on a hollywood set i was also a martial arts teacher so i would travel like my father across the country or to europe and 
and I would teach with my husband, martial arts. And I noticed in my travels to what we call red states today or, you know, more mm. conservative states that um, I noticed some of my hosts would, you know, who would host us um, when we would come in and teach would have to struggle once in a while with whether or not they should allow somebody who was gay into their schools or part of the LGBTQ community, which stunned me as a mixed race mm. woman who, who as a child grew up in a time where I, I would witness my mother and father being mistreated for being a mixed race couple. In fact, they were married. Um, my, my parents were married in a time where um, uh, the interracial marriage was pretty much against the law in a lot of states across the country. And so California was one of the few states that, you know, if you were a white person, you could intermarry with somebody who was African American or Asian, whatever, you know, and, um, but uh, thank goodness for the S Supreme Court ruling on Virginia versus Loving, which opened the door in 60, 68, 69, but it was a tough time for my parents. So mm -hmm. getting back to being a martial arts teacher, that's what um, I started noticing that this doesn't, this doesn't feel right in my soul. And then came the Matthew Shepard case. And mm -hmm. that was very upsetting for me. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Matthew Shepard case, that's a uh, that was a huge pivotal um, uh, event about it, where Matthew Shepard, who was a gay man, gay college student, uh, living in Laramie, Wyoming, and he was kidnapped and murdered. And that really started a sparked a conversation in our country about what is go what was going on with the gay community. And um, I just thought, you know, with my own personal experience as a martial arts teacher. Uh, seeing the Matthew Shepard case, which was disturbing as a mixed race woman. And then also my own cousin coming out as a gay woman. I just thought mm -hmm. I, I need to be able to express myself. And it just felt right to write this story. And if I was going to take a chance of being a filmmaker, I wanted something that would express myself as a human being and the issues that I think are important to address. And I'm glad I did. Definitely. And the messages that you intended were definitely shine through for sure. Um, so you play the role of Karen O'Neill, the sensei who takes on McLean under her wing. Yeah. And Karen, she's, a, she's a Karen. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, definitely has a different way to it now. <laughs> I mean, like, it was made in the mid-2000s. Who, yeah, who would have right. been? You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Sure I mean, that. like, <laughs> aside from the ironic naming now, um, it, it, otherwise, it's a very heavy role that you took on. I was curious, like, what did you do to mentally prepare for playing this character? Um, I had to lose a lot of weight. That was hard. Um, uh, I had to get in shape mentally. I trained. I, I, I knew because I had to wear two roles, one as an actress and one as a, a director. I, I was studying, actually, the checkoff method just so I could kind of shift gears very quickly and pivot when I had to be an actress and then when I had to be a director. And then luckily I was um, also invited to the set of A Million Dollar Baby where my friend oh. Riker invited me to the set. So I was watching Clint Eastwood in live action kind of pivot back and forth and, you know, kind of just getting ideas like how I can do this. So that's how I pr pretty much prepared as, a, as a, a filmmaker. But I did a lot of research on this. I really wanted to address um, how the AIDS, you know, uh, uh, epidemic was impacting communities, particularly in rural area. We tend to mm. talk about the the you know the whole issue of when AIDS first kind of landed on our shores. We tend to kind of see it more from the urban perspective. Rarely do we hardly see it from from the the rural uh, perspective in small town. And so you know I had to really do my homework about you know what, how um, this you know this you know these issues are addressed in these small communities. And luckily, as a martial arts teacher, I was already kind of seeing that firsthand and knew how to apply that. Hmm. So it sounds like you had to adapt quickly to that. Yeah, considering that there were some places that did not want our production there to film. And I was, uh, I remember um, it was pretty difficult because we had been rejected to film in certain locations. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always believe in being transparent. So I was pretty clear with certain school districts what we were addressing in, in my screenplay. And mm -hmm. um, I was really stunned that Jefferson County would would reject us. And um, 
apply something on that, like the Columbine experience to my screenplay. And I'm like, this, this movie has nothing to do with gun violence. What? Oh yeah. But they were pulling. Yeah. They were, <laughs> they were, they were definitely, you know, you know, trying to find some way to say no. So they thought this could be a way by, you know, somehow equating Columbine to my movie. I'm like, this has nothing to do with that kind of experience. And, for me, the least yeah, and I, and for me, having family members that had experienced their own mass gun shooting in in Stockton, California, I'm like, you are not going to get away with that. So I put out a press statement, and and it caught wind. Uh, um, the Associated Press was really good about catching on on the story, and so we uh, we were all of a sudden on the radar, um, particularly with the Matthew Shepard case, and also thanks to my associate producer Aaron Quill, um, we were also getting that kind of um, attention again from from the LGBTQ community and their support, which was so important. And um, here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, this might sound like a bit of a weird question, but was the Sensei always meant to be an independent production? Yeah, as much as I would have loved it to have you know done it commercially through the studios. I mean, when you are a woman or a person of color trying to get a studio, I mean film made at that time period, it's, mm. it, it's really tough. I mean, you had to know in people on the inside to do this and we just weren't there, but it made sense for it to be an indie film. And luckily because of my training in Hollywood, being on so many sets, um, I was really, thank goodness, able to pull a lot of resources. I had great producers that, uh, that locked arms with me and that were amazing from uh, my producing partner, Tara Keitman, my husband, Ron Balicki, was a producer. My associate producer, Aaron Quill and Shell Kong were very important to me. I had Brad Thornton. I mean, there were just, um, there were so many people that were helping um, in different aspects of, in different stages to help get this film done. And in many ways, we all had had some sort of unique experience to where we could relate to what the storyline was about and we felt it was important movie to to share and to have a voice and i'm so glad i you know i did it you know i did it to this day i still get um emails from people saying thank you for making this movie it saved my life growing up in a small town um i've had teachers that say they shared this movie with their students you know whether that was on a college level or a junior high or even a martial arts school i've had people share my film and uh, wow yeah so you know it's been amazing the journey yeah i mean i guess it's been i guess almost 13 years since it came out so yeah 2010 is when it got its royal launch through the district okay. system but mm -hmm. it, but we started the film festival um, around 2008, actually. And and then we had the crash around that time, another big world event kind of slowed oh, that's down. Right. Oh, that's right. gosh, the crash, you know. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, how am I going to get through this, you know. But we were lucky that we were one of the few indie films that did have distribution and digital distribution, which was so new at that time. Nobody was doing uh, streaming or di digital distribution. We were one of the first to do that. So now wow. we for, you know, um, um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Kyle Kazmarek who was able to get us with Netflix, which was very young in its infancy at that time. So, Whoa. yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> that is crazy. I had no idea. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I guess like with the whole pandemic going on, I completely forgot we had a recession 13 years had a ago. Recession. You guys are really young, but me, I mean, I <laughs> a lot of gray hair on my head, that whole thing. So. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to ask about um, regarding, uh, regarding something else regarding your character is that, um, you know, aside from the fact that she's a female martial artist and that she's an Asian woman in a predominantly white society, but you also made her mixed race like you. Yeah. I was like, wondering why, why was that important to show for you? Good question. Um, maybe it's because I, I think looking back, um, you know, I've seen a lot of families like mine and I never saw us on the screen, you know, and uh, I'm like, it's time to do this, to share this unique experience of, coming from a mixed Asian family, mixed, you know, and, and in the background, she had a white father. Um, 
And I should tell you, the sensing was really a three part story. And I did the middle section. A lot of people don't know this. The oh, film, yeah. The, the first storyline that I thought of, it was supposed to be about um, a gener a family generationally. So the story takes place in Colorado. And it really the heart of it starts with actually Karen's grandfather who befriends her father during World War II when he's in the camps and he becomes mm. and her grandfather becomes his sensei and he falls in love with their mother. And that it was the background story to Karen. But then I thought this is too much. Can't do all this. You know, they didn't have a budget for that because this was an indie film. And then the mm -hmm. third part of the storyline is really about, you know, how McLean becomes, uh, serves in the military and how he has to deal with the don't ask, don't tell era. So it's really, it's, it's sectional, it's three part, but I just took the middle part because that was so much easier to do in a small town under the humble budget that we had at the time. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then, you know, hearing yeah. that now, it, it makes sense because like there's a lot of like background context to it that you think that, hmm, I wonder why yeah. she put that there. Kind of seems like it's setting up for something else, but. exactly. Now I know that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the sense you really is an examination of the nature of tolerance and hate and how it can be manifested in different ways, you know? So, yeah. Do you think we'll ever see those first and third parts fully realized? You know, it's interesting. Um, there could be, yeah, there actually was some talks about doing that since I'm kind of in a different position now, you know? So yeah, uh, that, that could happen. So yeah, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> I also want to talk about the fight sequences. Can you talk about how those came together? Well, luckily, uh, having my husband next to my side, and then also I should say to one of my other co-producers, there's a, name, my name, a man named Mark Grove who lives in Colorado. Um, mm. So we were able to kind of, uh, you know, set up very quickly different fight scenes from the boxing sequences, and, and then of course my fight scene. So. It was, pre but I didn't want it to lead with being a martial arts film. I wanted it to be a drama where in the background we are dealing with a martial arts family and um, and kind of set up, set up um, more of a realistic kind of way of the, how self-defense would be used in the streets, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, it just, it wasn't a time for me to go atomic blonde on people, you know? I really wanted, <laughs> you know, and by the way, those, I, those people trained under my dad, so, uh, kudos to them, but um, getting back to this, I just really felt it was imperative to really base it in reality as much as possible. That makes a lot of sense. And it feels very grounded when you really think about it. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, uh, random question, did you, and I, I forget the name of the actor who played McLean, but did you two have stunt doubles at all? No, that was the hard part about it. Oh wait, I take that back. There, there is, there was my my co-producer was also Mark Grove was also a stuntman, so he doubled Joey on the whole car drag with the truck, which was oh. Fun. But it was very important in the casting process that I got people that were physically talented. So Michael Lasky, who who plays McLean, was actually already a, a childhood actor who grew up. He was now a teenager at that time. So he had always been a martial artist. So for the most part, he did all his own stunts. But um, Mark Grohl was able to double him for the the, the, the drag. And then mm -hmm. myself, you know, it was just easy because of my ability to to be able to, you know, just do my own fights, you know, and that 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 is just second nature for me to do that, you know. And, and many of the other people I casted, I already knew that they physically, uh, like Louis Mandelar, they all had some kind of, physical background that I knew that we could tap into safely mm -hmm. and be able to do these these fight scenes without anybody getting uh, hurt. I see. I just, the reason why I ask is that it's like, we're dealing with an independent film, you have a very limited budget, but even, you know, you're a stunt woman, you of all people know that like to do your own stunts, it's like, okay, we're taking a risk here with that. Yeah, well, but it, you know, and listen, I had contemplated back and forth whether or not I even wanted to play Karen. I honestly, oh. you know, I had wanted to be able to really focus too on storytelling as, as well. But then I thought I needed an actress that had major flexibility. And I, you know, I didn't know if that was something we could do on this indie film because we were up and down with financing and, 
you know, I, I just was, I, I didn't want to take the chance of it being such a yo-yo ride to where if I did cast another actress, you know, I might lose her down the road to another project, you know, and that had mm. happened a couple of times with people that I had originally casted. And then all of a sudden they, they had, you know, we had to, you know, hold off on production. And then all of a sudden the people I had casted uh, one or two roles were off doing something else. So that's why it just, it made more practical sense for me to just play the role, which was a little scary. And it's, I've always wanted to be an actress and here I am tapping into it now. And, but, you know, there was always that thing hanging over me, like, are they only going to just see me as a stunt woman? Do they not know that I also have an acting background? So, um, and, but then I thought, yeah, Uncle Bruce did this, so I can, I can hang with this. I, I think I can handle this, you know? Yeah. And like in the bigger scheme of things, like, I think there's, I think really only that, you know, that fight scene in the middle where that's right. like really where, yeah, that's really like the only time you see you fight throughout yeah. the entire film. Yeah. yeah. And the training sequences, of course. Right. Um, but yeah, it's very clear in the film that yes, you know how to act. They know how to act really well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so when the film came out, I'm curious, how did people from the Asian American community and the LGBTQ community respond to it? Oh, wow. Uh, they were so receptive. Um, a lot of tears, people crying. Um, my father, honestly couldn't believe I got this off the ground, to be honest with you. And he was in tears. Uh, my whole family was just like, bravo, you did it. You know, you did it. And, um, I, but I got to tell you, um, I also am so thankful to, you know, my team of people that were behind me, my cast and my crew. Um, and they were so patient because it is not easy, especially back at that time, technically to do um, an indie film. And we didn't have the technology like we have now, right? You could do now. You could mm -hmm. do it on your iPhone. Um, I mean, even the red cam wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is now. And and I shot that on Super 16, which I thought, to be honest with you, at that time, um, people uh, Hollywood was still sort of just starting to tr transition into the digital world, and so mm. I took advantage of being able to, you know shoot in super 16 since it takes place in the 1980s and i thought it could add to that whole 1980s element you know that that you know other time period you know so yeah yeah it does i think it does you have a good eye for it oh thank you <laughs> so when we spoke earlier in the year you mentioned how it's because of your work on the sensei that got you a role on the mandalorian I'm curious, ever since your episode aired, have people been discovering the sensei for the first time? And if yeah. so, what, how have they been responding to it? It's, it's just been incredible. Um, yeah, it's just like this whole new audience in other parts of the world now, people reaching out from Australia to Europe and uh, just like I said, a new generation of martial artists worldwide. And um, I, I just feel so grateful and so honored that this would happen, you know? Um, yes. And, and, and I'm just great. And then the sensei too was responsible for me being discovered to do the Mandalorian, which is, you know, I, it's amazing how serendipitous this whole process has been for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, um, yeah. Um, and I think to the humanitarian message of it all, um, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to do this and, and be ahead of the curve. You know, back then, there were people that, you know, when I made this movie, even in the martial arts community, they were kind of like, well, we don't want to see your movie. It, it, it just because, you know, you know, the gay thing. And I'm like, are you serious? Come on, you know. And now I think it's opened up a channel to where people now are even receptive in the martial arts world because the martial arts world was notoriously very, surprisingly very conservative. A lot of people don't know that. But now I think the sensei's allowed us to be able to have these conversations and, and for people to say, yeah, you know, I'm gay. So what, you know, I'm trans. So what, you know, it's, you know, I'm hoping that it added to the freedom to express yourself as a human being. You know? Absolutely. That's I guess like, I guess it's kind of the weird part for me. Um, when I see the film and I think about like whatever logic is going through, the people's minds where it's like you're willing to accept people who are of different races but yet when it comes to someone who's female or someone who is gay you suddenly don't 
feel as accepting for some reason. Yeah, uh, I, people were even stunned. They're like, come on, they wouldn't give her a black belt. You, I'm like, do you have any idea what kind of, what kind of prejudice there has been toward women in the martial arts industry where they're not given their credentials, their black belts, their instructorship? I mean, that's happened in, in many systems. So that was another thing that surprised people, you know, and that's why I say the sensei really is a look at how hate manifests in many different ways. You know? mm -hmm. And what do we, what can we do about that? You know, you know, where are we in our hearts about tolerance and, and, and being receptive to people that are different from ourselves? Can we, can we, as my godfather would say, can we, you know, empty our cups, you know, and be open-minded, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to see McLean and Karen bond as quickly as they did, because even though their struggles differ slightly, it's they bear the same way. They're both being excluded because of something that makes them different. They're outsiders. They're absolutely outsiders, you know, but they found strength in each other, you know. So, and she gives I'm them, curious. You know? Yeah. So I guess uh, going back to earlier when I was asking, uh, you know, if it was intentional to have this be an indie production, do you think if he, if he had made the sensei today, how do you think it would have come about? Do you think that a Hollywood production company would have backed you or how do you think that would have looked? Ooh, good question. I, I, I don't, I, but I do think they would. I actually think they would have leaned forward now because we're living in different times. You know, when you think about it, the, the hate crimes bill act wasn't even, even around, you know? Yeah. It just, I think, we're just, I mean, and, and you think about it, see 2010. So this happened rather quickly, this turnaround in our culture within over a decade, you know, mm -hmm. change. Um, and, and so, yeah, I do think I might've had a better chance and um, of, of making it and, and having a much bigger budget because it was hard. But I also, if you look at how many location changes there were, there were so many people that had uh, what I call the spirit of goodwill. And so I say goodwill is what helped, you know, fill in a lot of where that, where we couldn't cover it with money, you know, like we got a hospital for free, not once, but twice wow. for free because they believed in this issue because at that time, um, in, in parts of, um, uh, Sterling, Colorado and other small towns in Colorado, uh, the medical field was seeing how the AIDS or AIDS epidemic or HIV was impacting rural communities that couldn't even talk about this, that were too afraid to be stigmatized. And so you had entire families that were kind of in hiding, you know, or, you know, afraid that they were going to be shunned. And, and so that's one of the things I feel really good that we were doing an amazing thing as a production, you know, that we could talk about how this impacts small communities, you know, and um, and so that's why hospitals and there were other uh, agencies that were stepping up and allowing us to use things for free or giving us things and being flexible. We pretty much had an almost an entire town for free, Sterling, Colorado, despite that the school district wouldn't allow us to use their schools. The community itself uh, politically came together and um, for whatever reason, because they knew economically we could benefit this small town, they let us film the rest of the stuff around the school district. So I was like, hey, you know, <laughs> the film in your community, make a difference. So there, you know. So. so you filmed in that one town, but to film the school scenes, you had to go to a different town for it. Go in um, not Jefferson County, because we had been rejected twice. So it was another part of Denver, um, Denver, uh, was it Denver Metropolitan? I think that was able, and that was through the help of a police officer uh, who also named Cece, who came aboard and um, he, he was able to, to work out this connection. And so that's where we got the high school after, after three tries. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a rough ride. Let me tell you, Laura, it was a rough ride. But I mean, yeah. already it was a shock when you told me that you were getting death threats just because your yeah. main protagonist was gay. But oh my god! Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 There were people really threatening not only me but threatening members of my crew and my cast and um, and yeah. But you know, when you when you have a powerful message, um, sometimes people are just going to be afraid of that kind of light, you know. And um, you just have to kind of push through, you know. 
but I'm proud. I, I'm, I'm really proud of my team that we did. I think about the message of the film now, especially in what's been happening within the last year and a half. The Black Lives Matter movement reached a turning point within the last year. There have been attacks against the Asian American community. There have been attacks against the trans community. I mean, what goes through your mind when you think of how the message you have is still very relevant now? Um, it 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 saddens it saddens me, but yet it is it is the human experience, right? That we sometimes don't learn from history. And mm. sometimes when we don't learn from it, we do repeat it. And so, um, and yes, you're right. We have gone through many uh, fruitions of the same kind of conversation. But the one thing I feel confident that um, as much as it's a tough ride, and I do feel little by little with each struggle, we're getting uh, the message of equality quality and inclusivity and diversity that keeps getting stronger. I mean, the fact that the Census Bureau came out, and we're seeing now, you know, uh, the mix of families, right? This film festival is <laughs> a testament of the change of what we are seeing in our society. So as much as there's a lot of darkness out there that we see, you know, in our news, I'm also have a huge body of just weight of hope, you know, and, and that things are continuously as tough as it is, are getting better and better and better. I mean, if you go back to what my parents went through, we, mm. we are definitely, um, you know, we're doing, we're doing pretty good as much as, you know, and I, I and I hope to give people that kind of sense of hope. You know. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess this is kind of like the same question I just asked, but what goes, what does the sensei mean to you now in retrospect, especially with where you are at your career per currently? Oh, what does it mean philosophically? Um, well, when I wrote the sensei, um, and, it, and it still applies today, that is that, um, you know, the sensei stands for teacher in Japanese, right? And I just think that, you know, we can all be teacher to one another, you know? And, um, and even, even the people that I find maybe even offensive may teach us something about ourselves. It, it may be, maybe it takes, some, uh, takes us to a place where we, we have to kind of look at ourselves, you know, and understand, you know, what, is, what, what does, you know, trigger hate, you know, and how can I be a teacher of goodness and be a force for goodness? So in some ways, my, my heart and my mind is still in the same place of just as it was back then when I wrote the sensei. Um, today, I'm just glad that I'm able to comfortably now have this conversation without it being something, you know, like you did what? You know, I mean, I, I don't think I even told you about this, Lauren, but um, there mm -hmm. was a moment where we actually had, we had one uh, investor pull out on us. And so we were desperately trying to look for more funds. And I mean, I had this one guy from a mate, I, I will take this back. He had worked on a major studio film. I won't say, mm -hmm. this, but then he goes, "We'll just take it over. We'll just take it over, but we're gonna have to make the kids straight." And I just said, "No." What? Oh yeah, you would know. <laughs> I should write a book about I went to. And if I said this person's name, he was a director. And he was going. He, he wanted to take over my film, and I said, "No, absolutely not. You know, I'll wait. I don't care if it takes a year for me to wait for the rest of the funding. I'll do it. I'm gonna stick." to to this this path that I'm I'm walking because I really see that there's a need for it and I'm glad I did. I mean to change the the orientation of the protagonist that would defeat the purpose. Yep. Yep. They just wanted to make it a low budget karate kid too or karate kid. I'm like, no, 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 I I, I won't stand for it. You know, and I was really just blown away that somebody would even suggest that. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that person hears me say this because it, it is, it's just outrageous, you know, but yeah, back then they wanted to try it. They're like, yeah, we'll, we'll help you finish your movie, but I take it over. I direct it and the kid has to be straight, not gay. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> yeah. I mentioned this too, when we spoke about early in the year, I just find it so astonishing that people would be so against a project with a gay protagonist. I mean, like since then, you know, like 
although it's not perfect, seeing LGBTQ characters in mainstream has become very normalized, I would like to right? say. Right? Thank goodness, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard to believe, right, in, in 2021. But it was this way back then, you know. But that's, um, you know, that's also a generational thing. It, it's a testament to just change that's coming, you know, and a younger generation that's come up, you know. And sometimes, I, and I you know, let, let's, I, I, you know, I, I should say that most of the resistance was from, you know, people maybe my age group and older, a different generation, you know, and they had been programmed and cultivated to believe these kinds of things, you know, um, unless they maybe had loved ones in their own family that, you know, were part of the LGBTQ community. But, you know, um, thank goodness for progress, you know. So it's, I can't believe that there's a time that people were resistant about uh, and, and actually had real laws on the book that said if you were of one race, and you're and the person you were in love with was another race, you couldn't be married, you know? I mean, it's outrageous, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. And I, I witnessed that, you know? Hard to believe. <laughs> Hard to believe, indeed. Yeah. Uh, we're down to, I think, the last 10 minutes, and we have some questions coming in. Okay. So we have one person asking, any words of inspiration or advice for people with writer's block? Will there be more films written by you? Ah, well, uh, <laughs> trust me, I, I go through writer's block, but it's it, writer's block, you know, and that's, that's normal. Um, I sometimes find for me, and I can only, and I, and every writer is unique and different. I, I find that it helps if you can find a private place for you. I don't care if it's even at the library. Um, and then sometimes you may just write, just write, even if it's just terrible, just write, 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 and then come back to it later on. Um, but it, you know, you, you just have to kind of get that muscle going, you know? Um, so don't, don't feel bad it, that it's perfectly normal to feel that, that process, you know? Um, you know, I know there are things I am working on right now. Um, it's been a little bit challenging during the pandemic because my family's in my house. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't quite have all the privacy and the noise levels where I need them to be. But uh, there are some things that I'm working on. I definitely want to get back behind the camera again and shoot um, again as a director. And then also, um, I think Lauren, you and I discussed this when I did the interview, I was working um, as a producer on a, a project about my father when he trained the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. So we're, we're working on, on that as well. And uh, we just kind of need the pandemic just to give us a little bit of room and get out of the way. But yeah, so that's definitely something I'm, I'm very pleased that, that I'm working on. So. Yeah, I mean, that project sounds amazing. I can't wait until we can all see it. Yeah, me too. Because it's it's a great story of east meets west and it's about how you know um you know to see that you know um how martial arts impacted something as uh you know like american football is is incredible and the fact that it's a true story is pretty awesome so yeah nice i'm trying to see where we are with questions we got quite a few actually um we have a question about directing, but it sounds like you already answered that. Um, another question someone has is, when you look back, what was the most difficult part of doing this film aside from raising money? Uh, what was the most difficult part? Um, that's hard. I, you know, to be able to, the, the most difficult part was cultural for me. Personal. I mean, of course, there's the money part of it that's so stressful. But I knew through using creative ways of financing, I, we could get through this, you know. Um, but I think more it was just the cultural part of it back then of, of resistance from people that really were threatened by me doing a, a project about a gay teenager. And then I think, too, also the fact that... Um, I was filming this in Colorado where the landscape was a little bit different looking compared to what it is now. And so I think they just thought, who are these people? And, you know, um, I mean, I have one of my actors and he had some 
good old boy say, it's nice to be white. I mean, it was just weird stuff that was happening around us. But for every bad thing that happened to us, um, where somebody said something that was hurtful or, or hateful, there were, I don't know, the universe sent us five, 10 people to, to support us and help us one way or the other, you know? So um, I, 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 but that's kind of what was, was difficult was the cultural part of it in the pushback, but which made me realize even more so there was a need for this project. Nice. Uh, another question. It's something you addressed already, but I'll go ahead and ask this anyway. What was the attitude of the martial arts community at the time? Chuck Norris gave you a bit of business, yes? Uh, wait, say that again about Chuck? Uh, so this person was that also mentioned Chuck Norris gave you a bit of business. <laughs> yeah, so Chuck, well, Chuck has known me and our family since, um, you know, I was a baby. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think Chuck, to his credit, you know, you know, he was di very diplomatic with me. I think it was just a hard concept to wrap around when he first saw even the trailer. But nonetheless, you know, they were, you know, he was really gracious, you know. And yeah, if anything, I just hoped that the movie just gave an older generation a moment to take pause and to kind of look at this. From a different perspective so and 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 i appreciate chuck chuck uh before i even did this movie um would hire me to stunt double for a lot of his wonderful actresses that were on the show in texas oh yeah. very cool yep. another question someone asked is what was the most crucial turning point of your career as a filmmaker slash martial arts slash actress what was it, the crucial turning point crucial turning point was giving myself honestly permission to to direct because a lot of I did not want to look at myself 20 30 40 years from now and wonder what would have happened if if I just only would have just tried to make my own project you know and you know luckily you know for those of you who don't know my 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 one of my godfathers my first godfather was the late Bruce Lee and so I was lucky to have him as a role model um, and to see what he accomplished when Hollywood told him no, because he was an Asian man trying to have a career in Hollywood and he had to go to Hong Kong. And my own mother said, what if, you know, what if you took a chance, you know, you know, you know, Bruce did the same thing. Why don't you do it, dear? You know? And I'm like, huh, yeah. And I, you know, my years as a stunt woman, I, I had a lot of training by just watching all these different directors and producers. So it was really just giving myself permission to try to to face my deepest fear and just go forward. Um, so that was a very pivotal moment for me. And then, uh, you know, and then now, uh, had I not done the sensei, I, I really don't think Dave Filoni, I don't think he would have been able to have found me if I didn't take that risk. So it's always about taking calculated risk, but I'm glad I did because um, the journey has been really cool, especially when you're on, you're on a Star Wars set. It's been amazing. <laughs> Speaking of Star Wars, the next questions are about that. I think we're just, people are excited that we have Magistrate Morgan Elspeth <laughs> at Mixation <laughs> Media Fest. Why, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. So this person's asking, I always thought you could take Rosario. How much training did she have to do to be at level to spar with you? gonna mess with Rosario. That woman is tough. <laughs> she scares me. You can tell her she scares me. I wouldn't mess with her. She's a she channels Ahsoka. My gosh. <laughs> no, but she's she's actually physically she is talented. I, I had worked with Rosario years back on rent when I was a stunt woman. And she you was, were a stunt woman on rent? Yeah, I worked on, on, on rent. Oh I, my god. I had met her mom. I actually hung out with her uh, at the lunch table while Rosario was up out there giving an interview with the, the Associated Press, and and you know, and, and and ironically, it was when I was getting ready to do shoot the Sensei, and we had just hit the Associated Press. So wow, in between job, um, you know, we had to film the Sensei, then we had to stop, 
I worked on the re on rent and then I went back to shoot the sensei. And anyway, it was just kind of, or was it before or somewhere in between, it was all happening at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and I loved the people from rent and they were so supportive. Like you do it, you, you go, you, you can do this, you know? So yeah, but Rosario is a, is a phenomenal talent. And I mean, athletically, she can, she can do anything. She's, a, she's just that talented. So I don't know. <laughs> I definitely believe that. But I mean, for those who don't know, like Rosario and Diana, basically, yeah, they did the first uh, fight between two women in a live action Star Wars production. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And to be two women of color. We yes. Both, we both realized the, the magnitude of that, you know, uh, that we were going to do this historical, historically, this first fight scene, we did not live action, uh, it, you know. What an honor! What an honor that Dave Filoni and uh, John Favreau would, would give us. You know, what an honor. Uh, there's one more question, which is also Star Wars related, which is um, I'm not sure if you can answer it, but I'll ask anyway. Will you be returning to the Star Wars universe? I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. Let, let me explain something to you. To the, okay. To my fellow Star Wars nerds, okay? I'm one of them. They are so secretive in Lucasfilm. I, I have no idea. I didn't even know my name was Morgan Elspeth until the night it aired. That's how crazy it, it gets, the secrecy, the level of secrecy. I just knew I was the magistrate. I had given myself my own name because I didn't know what her name was and in but so I, I had no idea completely her background until Rosario or Ahsoka's character even was telling Mando her history. I'm like, I did that. I, my character can't, you know, conquered all these worlds. Holy smokes. I'm Morgan. Everybody's making a big deal about, you know, baby Yoda being called Grogu. I'm like, wait a minute. I got a name. I got a name. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So um, if I, I, I just don't know. We'll, we'll see. And you know, fingers crossed. So if, if you like the character, write into Disney or Lucasfilm and say, bring back the magistrate. But until then, I, I, I just don't know. So, but my fingers are crossed. You hear here, folks. If you want Diana to show up in the Star Wars universe again, do that. Hashtag bring back the magistrate. <laughs> bring back the magistrate, yes. <laughs> Get that trending. <laughs> So we're just about out of time, but I do want to give you the opportunity to plug. Where can people find the Sensei? And if they want to keep up, keep up to date with what you're doing, where can people follow you? I know right now you can go to Fandango now. That's probably the best place to find it. Oh, my gosh. And there's one other str uh, streaming place, too, as well. So, But definitely you can find it there at Fandango.com. Uh, Fandanglenow.com. Uh, okay. And then, you know, a lot of times when you do these films, too, they may uh, pivot and find another streaming thread, you know, so we'll see. I think I know at one point, I think even we were on Hulu. I don't know. I wish I had my manager here to remind me exactly where exactly. But I definitely know you can find this on Fandango now. So. And where can people follow you? Oh, where can they follow me? Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, you can follow me on Instagram at uh, the real Diana Leona Santo. Um, that's where I'm. I mainly love being just because I can watch all those dance videos. It's really cool. Uh, <laughs> I love Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm still kind of well, you know, setting up my my following base there. You can find me there. And once in a while, I'm on Facebook too at uh, at the real Diana Leona Santo. But mainly Instagram. So I'm definitely there. Awesome. Well, Diana, thank you so much for your time and for being here today and for letting us show the sensei. It's truly been an honor and a pleasure to have you here. It's an honor for me too. And I guess I'm back tomorrow too, right? I guess too. Well. That's right, everyone. She will be on a panel tomorrow. I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but if you can go to our agenda and look her up, yeah. you'll know. You'll get to see her again tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We're called, it's called We're Not All Ninjas. The panel is called We're Not All Ninjas. Yeah, we're not all Thank in you to our producer. What a great time. I love that title. So, and thank you. Adrian, everyone. Sa <laughs> Adrian Samantha Wynn and Yoshi Sudarso as well. Yes. I'm excited. So, but thank you. And thank you everybody for, you know, watching and supporting. Thank you, ma'am. I love you guys for what you're doing. I love the Mamfest. I love that. I'm part of the first year. This is awesome. 
you know. That means so much to hear from you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. So. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. You have until tomorrow to check it out. So get going on that. And take of care, everyone. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs>